Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Good. Um, welcome to this very exciting session on big urban data. I am not Michael Chewy from McKinsey. Michael is in a taxi facing the great urban problem of traffic. So maybe our panelists here can help him in the future solve to know where traffic is. So I ask for your indulgence uh, as I am replacing our moderator at the very last minute. But I hope I will at least facilitate this fantastic panel of speakers we have uh, here today. So the topic of the panel is big urban data, which is an extremely fashionable term, but perhaps one that is ill understood. I think it's fair to say that um, big urban data, people sense that it, is, it represents a, a real um, source of innovation and problem solving for cities, but it's still an emerging field. And so the questions we're going to be looking at uh, today are some of, of the following. Can the human city be data driven? So is there, can, can human and data really cohabit and can one empower the other? Who collects and uses and extracts this data and the value from this data and who owns it? How should it be accessed and regulated to empower innovators while protecting our rights as citizens, for example? What are the key trends in innovation in the use of this data? And um, what are some of the concrete examples that we can show that can point to the future on big urban data? And finally, how predictive is big urban data? How can it help us learn about problems before they happen? So we have a fantastic panel um, with us today that I'd like to introduce. Um, to my left is Bruno Lechag. He is the Executive Vice President and Global Sales and Strategy and Operation of 3DS Value Operations, and he's the North America uh, Managing Director. To his left is David Sasaki, who is a Principal for Investments at Omidyar Network. Further down is Rand Hindi. Rand is the co-founder and CEO of SNPs, one of the most exciting big urban data startups anywhere based in Paris. To his left, we're particularly delighted to welcome Pedro Junquera. Pedro leads a project that I am sure you have all read about in every single newspaper in the world, which is this very exciting operations center in Rio de Janeiro. So we're very pleased that uh, Pedro has joined us from not too far away in Rio de Janeiro. And finally, uh, at the far end is Christian Norlin. Christian has a very cool job title, which is Master Researcher at Ericsson Research uh, User Experience Lab. So I think it's fair to say that we have a perfect panel to address this question. Um, I want us to get started briefly um, with a round of questions. Uh, I'll ask one question per panelist, then we'll have a general discussion, and then I really want all of you to uh, step in. So we're going to save the last 15, 20 minutes for your questions. So please prepare your questions. Let me first start with, um, with David. <clears throat> There's this, uh, this term of quantified self. So what is this quantified self? And what does it really imply in terms of uh, a, a quantified city? Yeah, I, I think that we're all part of this movement. Can you hear me OK? Is that better? We're, we're all part of this movement of the quantified self to a certain degree because our healthcare system uh, obligates us to be. We all check our cholesterol and our weight and our blood pressure and we adapt our diet accordingly to the data that comes out from those different sensors and monitors. But the real self trackers, the real kind of people who identify with the quantified self, they take it to a whole new level. They have bracelets and they have sensors they attach to their head and they measure their brain waves and how well they're sleeping. They measure their amino acids, they analyze their DNA. And with all of this information, they say, what do I know about myself? They, they say that this is self-knowledge through numbers. I'm constantly monitoring how my body is and how my health is and how my brain is doing and I'm learning more about myself that way. It's becoming a very popular movement, uh, especially in Silicon Valley where my work is based. 
And it makes me think about two things. I think it's reflective about two trends, uh, especially among younger people these days. One is that we're obsessed with data. Data has become cool. Statisticians have become cool. We all read about big data and open data all the time. Two, I think that it represents our increasing individualism. Uh, so the idea of the quantified self is very much about me, about self-perfection, about trying to block out the rest of the world and thinking, how can I use all these measurements so that I can become faster and I can have 60 orgasms a month and I can do all of these different things, but you're not thinking about the concerns of other people in your cities and the communities. You're not thinking about the quantified city and how can we address the problems that face all of us. So this is what I'm particularly interested in, is how can we apply the model of the quantified self where we're tracking indicators all the time and we're adjusting our behavior based on what those indicators show us to our cities to address common problems, which can be problems like traffic and access to water and electricity that we all know about, but also things about just kind of quality of life and perception and how do we know if teachers are good teachers or, or bad teachers. So that's, that's what I'm particularly focused on these days. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Um, Christian, a general question to you. Um, what, what is the general role from, a, from your, your vantage point in, in, in research for Ericsson? What is the role of, of big data in cities overall, cities as systems? And how do we think about really tapping into that data and making that, that data useful, extracting it and pushing it out to, so that it's useful to, to citizens? I think, uh, so, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, I think, thank you for a very broad question. Um, I think it's kind of like it's difficult to sort of avoid data today. It's like someone just said in, in, a, in a recent speak, uh, data is also like the pollution of the 21st century to some extent. You know, it's like you can't avoid it. It's everywhere. It's being generated by cities, by citizens, by corporations, by communities and so forth. So it's, it's like I would say in, in my world, in my world view, I would say that data is actually part of everything all the time. The thing is, we don't see it that, that very often. So it's kind of like an invisible sort of texture to everything that we do and that we perceive, which I think is quite interesting. So one of the things that I think we need to address more is actually how to make that, that texture obvious to people, to organizations, to authorities, to cities, um, to understand what you can actually do with it. What kind of properties do you hold in, that, in the data that is all around you, that you generate and that other people generate uh, around you. If you do that, I think we can start to think about various interesting opportunities. Because it's not only about surveillance, it's not only about tapping into like, what's happening, but it's also about what you can do with the data and from what perspectives. Pedro, you will talk about your network operating center later on, which I think is a very, very good example from a city perspective. But also you can think about it like, what could it mean to individuals, to, co to, society, to communities who might have specific problems or specific issues? I personally think that mo most problems in a society can actually be identified best by the ones experiencing those problems. And also the solutions can also be identified best by those very communities. I think, and what we're looking into quite a lot right now, is how on earth can data become something that communities can utilize in order to solve their immediate problems themselves? Who facilitates that sort of uh, that, that understanding and, and, and those sort of new things to build upon? Uh, that's one thing that we're looking into. From a business side of uh, point of view, it's also quite interesting because there's a lot of data floating around and the ownership of that data is not very clear. Whose data is it anyway? It's like, yeah, if I'm driving my car and it generates traffic data to the city, but is it yours or mine? Who's the owner of that? How do we deal with those kind of transactions? If I give you something, what do I give in return? Those kind of things are very interesting to look into uh, when it comes to data in cities today. And also in, in, in relation to other people. On, and, and like if I drive my car and I give something away, and, and you can tap into that as another driver, for instance, we can actually start to collaborate around things like that. Who facilitates those transactions and how, how do we make them transparent enough for people to understand what's happening? Uh, so those are kind of like, it sounds like big challenges, and of course they are, but they're also quite interesting to think about, like, because they hold a lot of opportunities. And from a business side of view, how do you make money, or how do you sort of deal with those kind of things? Because we have, like, for, for instance, like the telecom industry, we have a lot of data floating around. 
But who owns that data and what can we do with it? What kind of agreements do we have with the ones creating this data? How do we give it back to them? How do we sort of, how are we open with it? Those are the things that we're thinking about right now. A lot about like making sure that people know what's happening, a lot about transparency, a lot about value sharing. Those kind of things are quite interesting. Great. Thanks very much, Christian. I think that's a, that's a very important uh, question that I hope we'll, we'll answer on this panel is whose d data is it anyway? That's a, that's a very uh, key question and I very much like the, um, the, the turn of phrase you used of making the texture of data obvious. That's, that's an interesting way to put it. As you can hear, there's a lot of background noise here. So I would, I would ask that all of our speakers please speak directly into the microphone so that you all can hear. Can you hear okay or is it okay? All right, well, so speakers, if you could speak directly into the microphone and speak up a little bit. Pedro, you are, you're, you're, you, 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 you handle and you deal with a volume, variety, and speed of data, maybe like no other city in the world. I mean, essentially, I'd, I'd, I'd really like you to first start by describing this fantastic operation center, which I had the pleasure of seeing, and it's absolutely remarkable. So if you could just describe it a little bit, because it's one of the great global concrete examples. And then just tell us how on a day-to-day -day basis, how you deal with this amount of data and what do you do with it? Well, good morning. Hello. Uh, the operation center is a building. It integrates 30 agencies, organs of the, that run the city, be it the city hall, be it the state, or also uh, companies that work for the city, for example, the trains, okay? Inside of this building, inside of this place, we monitor through 900 cameras and applications and physical contacts. We monitor and we run the city. And in the year of 2010, Rio de Janeiro has suffered uh, high intense rain, more than 300 millimeters that day. This is a huge number for those who know it. And in that particular moment, the mayor decided that he, he had to have a place where everyone could go and solve a big disaster in that particular moment, a big disaster, big problems. When we were born, we started to see that disasters are not only the big ones are also the day-by-day -day disasters. For example, we, as we were talking, Michael didn't arrive this event because of not a big disaster, but because of a problem. He's not here. Um, so our job, our core business, is to save lives, to make the city more livable, more happier, through, uh, through efficiency, through integration. Okay? And talking about information, information is everywhere. It's here on our pockets, on our credit card system. As an ideal situation or community, what we can do is use all this information to work with it. The operations center has got a, an application. It's based on Google Earth, where we have more than 100 layers of information. For example, where the guard is because of his cell phone, it has a GPS. Where are all the, the spots in the city where usually when it rains a lot, we have problems with water there together and the cars can pass, for example. We, we have information about in, in slums and favelas, where are the people that can listen to the sirens or that can walk because they have particular deficiencies? So when we have monitoring the weather, when we know it's going to rain, we have the sirens over there, we know that we have reached a high level of rain and we have to, to turn the sirens on. Okay, people will leave, this, leave that community, but what about those who can listen? Everything is in our application. It's called Hill Media. And by this, 
of our intention is to be as much connected as possible to citizens, to the public services, to NOGs and NGOs, NGOs, and use this platform to integrate. Uh, we don't believe in a city functioning well without integration. So the challenge is not only as technology evaluation, development, but also in terms of uh, between people. Uh, I, all the time I say the most important technology I have here uh, are those brains, are those arms and legs that work with us. Technology helps us, in, helps us delivering what we must do, save lives and make the city better. Pedro, I wonder if you can um, just elaborate a little bit more on the technical side of the operations center. Tell us how technically the data is collected and fed through, um, not from a sort of analysis point of view, but from a data collection point of view. How are you getting all this information? Well, for the last two, we are two years, we have two years old, two and a half. We've put big effort on achieving data, okay? So uh, we don't need them structured. Our IT crew, they search information, they, they love information, they love data. So we, one very important layer that we have, for example, is a layer that shows us where we have a problem uh, in terms of energy supply. So if we don't have light in a particular quartier, a, a part of a neighborhood, we know about it. And then we can use our cell phones or SMS or text message and do something. So the information is collected. In, in each case is a situation differently. What we do is translate the data that we, we can achieve and put them all in this particular platform that integrates it. Because in the past, all of us that like data or work with it, we had a sen common sense that if the language was not the same, we couldn't integrate data. So if I work with Excel spreadsheets and you work with SKL, we can talk together. We can talk to each other, for example. Perhaps this is not the best example. but uh, Now, big data came as a word, as a term, but to show us that even if you don't speak the same language, we can translate them and put them together and work. So uh, we have an IT team that goes to every partner from whose information we are interested and bring them to the operations center. And there, in-house, in we work the information, we work the data. Fantastic. Great. Thank you so much, Pedro. Really, the, the Rio Operation Center is, is phenomenal. Um, I want to turn to Bruno. Uh, Bruno, um, I want to talk about how you visualize this data and what is the role of, of technology suppliers and also tr you know, vi people who help visualize this data and bringing, to li bringing it to life. Because you work a lot with 3D and really you, 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 you put it in a shape that's very pragmatic and usable for the decision maker. So can you talk about a little bit about that aspect? Yeah, I, I'm, I, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm going to introduce and um, I came with a small video in order to illustrate why I'm going to tell you. Uh, first of all, uh, with Dassault System, we, we strongly believe that the virtual world can help to structure this big data. This is about uh, infrastructure, it's about building, it's about products, uh, and uh, it's how you combine them with the nature and the life. So by doing simulation, modelization and simulation of all these objects, we do believe that we are able to uh, uh, really be in a situation where you, you can look at what you have, you can what you want to do, you can simulate and you can monitor the, this big data, whatever it's structured data or unstructured data. And for that, uh, you need to consider that as a system, as a very complex system 
as you can see in the existing very complex product. So at the moment, what we do is that uh, we are applying all the technology we have been putting place in order to, to support the industry, aerospace, and a lot of sector to apply that to the city. Uh, on top of that, what you, you have to understand is that the day it's a virtual plus real world, you can leverage all the social network and being sure that all the actors, the citizens, uh, can contribute to the evolution of what they live every day. So the citizen will more and more become an actor. So what I propose that we, we look at this five minutes video which is going to frame what I just told you. So, so the, what, what you have seen here is the usage of 3D for, for really doing the, the, the model, the, 3D, the exact 3D model of the city. So when you have that, then you are able to do simulation, how people are going to behave, our car, our, uh, and then as soon as you have that, you can monitor uh, the way, what you have planned compared to what is happening every day. And uh, this is the idea. I will, I will post this video so that everybody uh, can see it fully. But at the end, this is our vision that clearly uh, uh, the high tech can come with a solution which uh, is going to help us clearly to do things virtually before you change really in the real life. And I, I think what one of the most interesting uh, parts of this, this kind of tool and visualization in general is how it helps public decision making. I mean, before you built a stadium and you know you said well, you kind of hoped that your stadium would do well in terms of transport and energy but now with all this data if you know how to an analyze it and represent it you can help the decision making process have you uh, bruno just in, in in 20 seconds do you have any concrete examples of interactions between yourselves and city governments in terms of them helping it helping them 
to make decisions? So the, the, answer, the answer is yes. In fact, we are, we are working closely with uh, uh, China at the moment, uh, building city, coming with a virtual project that uh, uh, their subcontractor can use in order to take decision with the, uh, uh, the urban planner and all the, the executive who are taking decisions. So this is really a process which is going on right now. And uh, whatever they do, put a new uh, highway, put a, a new bridge and things like this, they will come with the virtual model in order, even for the people who are going to live there, what it means and what will be the impact on their daily life when they are going to build that and the result. Right. Great. Thank you so much. Rand, um, I'm going to turn to you. Um, first of all, I'd like you to just very briefly describe to our audience your own story, which is a pretty amazing story, and the story of SNPs and how you, you came to this. And then I'll ask you a follow-up question, which is really about uh, the skills needed and the talent needed, because Pedro was saying the, you know, the key technology is really people. So who's working on this, and, and are there any bottlenecks in sort of progressing this field of, of big urban data? And, and okay. if I can ask you to Can you hear me? Okay, because I can barely hear myself, so I'm going to try and uh, just do signs if you cannot hear me. Uh, so we... Okay, just how it started. <laughs> See? Hey, how cool is that? Yeah, by the way, we do predictive technology seriously, so that's a good example. So the way it started is uh, when I was doing my PhD a few years ago, I got interested in healthcare. And, uh, you know, I've decided to uh, look at it more closely, looked at nutrition, figured out that everybody was saying something different, so eventually decided to create my own personal diets. Uh, this you know, got me to quantify itself. Uh, but the difference is that to test, you know, dieting on myself, I needed to be fat, which I wasn't. So I put on 35 kilos to actually test my theories. And, you know, well, it kind of worked. Anyway, so after that, I've decided healthcare was just too difficult to get into from a business perspective when you're a startup. Just too many regulations, too many, you know, hard place to enter. So we started thinking about what other problems we could solve using big data and machine learning, so predictive technologies. And we looked around us and we realized we all live in cities and every single thing we do is either a pain or is inefficient. I'm sorry, but that's, that's the truth. You know, I commute to work every day. Every time I go to work, I'm like squeezed in a small subway. When I do decide to take my car, I'm in a traffic jam. If I'm not in a traffic jam, I'm not gonna be able to park. You know, all of these things at the end makes it very frustrating to live in a city. So we've decided to build SNPs which is a company that does a big data analysis to build predictive models that can be applied to essentially anticipate what happens in cities and prevent problems from happening in the first place. So, you know, it's pretty cool. We've done it for public transport in France. Uh, we're doing it for crime. We're doing it for parking. Uh, so we can apply it to many different things. Uh, the skills that you need is really the key thing here. The technology is out there. You know, I mean, it's fine. Whatever you use Hadoop or whatever, it doesn't really matter. What's important is the team that you build and the way you look at the data. Because looking at the data is very easy, finding some correlation is very easy, but creating a model that actually works and keeps working in the future is very difficult. And typically the skills that you need to do that are people who are very good with data, so often you know, scientists, researchers, uh, but also people who are able to code, right? So if you don't know how to code well, well, you're not going to be able to analyze 20 terabytes of data. You know, it's not trivial. You're going to need to somehow put up like a cluster and analyze this and understand it. But most importantly, what you need are people who are creative, right? You need people to look at a data set about, let's say, housing prices and figure, hey, you know, that's a good way maybe to measure how rich people are in specific areas and thereby use this information for crime. See, you need people to look at data sets and see something different than the obvious thing that's actually being measured. Right. And once we find those people who are scientists, you know, coders, and creatives, those very, very rare people, if you find them, they want to work for your company, like, keep them, honestly, because there aren't that many around. And, you know, for us, we've been lucky that we've created this culture from the beginning. Uh, so today, 80% of the people working with us have a PhD, and everybody's like in, you know, constant prototyping mode. So on a daily basis, people come up with ideas. They're like, oh, hey, you know, Chicago opened up a crime data set. We could use it for this, this, and this. 
And this is how we actually come up with new things to offer to our clients. Great. Ren, can I just ask a quick follow-up question, just 30 seconds. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on now? Because I think it's, it's, it's useful to people to hear some concrete examples of these uses that people who are really on the frontier of big data are working on. So can you just very quickly give us a couple of examples of the projects that you're working on and yeah. the problems you're aiming to solve? So one of the big, one of the big projects we've been working on, we've been working with the SNCF, the French uh, railway, uh, and we built a predictive model that can essentially predict how many people are on board the Parisian public transport trains. So, you know, we can actually essentially tell you, you know, in this train at this time tomorrow, there's going to be X number of people. This information is actually important because not only does it allow you as an operator to anticipate load and therefore, you know, plan for bigger trains or redo your schedule accordingly, if you give this information to passenger, it also gives them the ability to choose a train that's maybe less full. And what happens is that instead of having very narrow peak hours, you end up like spreading the loads across a larger time span and thereby you know, making comfort better for everybody and making punctuality higher. So this is a very clear example. And this is something that's happening. We're launching it this month, actually, in France. So it's, uh, like it's a real thing. Fantastic. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Christian, I want to turn back to you really quickly. So in our pockets, in all of our pockets, we have one or two mobile devices, probably. I, pro I think I have three on me right now. So these mobile devices are a, a part of our life now. You know, a anybody who who's, doesn't know that is in extreme denial. These, these mobile devices are essentially, essentially the production factory for all this data. And they're also the collection points. So what's the role of, of ourselves empowered by these mobile devices in this debate about, about big urban data? Well, um, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's very true. Uh, these devices, they contain a lot of um, ways of measuring what they're doing and how they're being used and where they are and so forth. We have GPS, we have gyros, we have accelerometers and so forth. Uh, and by the way, uh, these are like 15% of all the handset devices in the world. There are 85% uh, of, device, uh, of, the, of the mobile device market are actually feature phones still. So, I mean, we are the lucky ones, I have to say. Uh, this doesn't mean, though, that these feature phones don't generate data as well. They do, actually. So we have a lot of information in these devices. We also have a lot of the information in the networks which, of course, feature phones are contributing to by actually being used, being at certain places, and so forth. So even if you have a very low-end phone, you can actually understand where that phone is, more or less, not as precisely as this one, but precise enough. So there is intelligence here, and there is intelligence in, in the network. Uh, and we can actually start to utilize a lot of the sensory readings and a lot of the data that these devices all kinds of mobile devices are, are, are generating today. Um, in the networks, for instance, we've already done that for ages in the mobile industries, of course, in, in planning the networks and understanding what's happening, peaks, you know, things, you know, how to optimize the technology. We can now also start to track other things, of course, and I'm going to talk about privacy in a second, but uh, just going to talk about like, things like uh, being able to track where people are, for instance, not individuals, anonymized individuals. You can actually start to get a sense of like what's happening in a city over peak hours and so forth. Um, we have a collaboration with MIT who are talking about this today, for instance. But that sort of information is gathered in the network that we can actually extract and start to utilize. There is information in these devices that we can start to utilizing as well. We're currently thinking about how to tap into sensors, of course, with the permission of the users, uh, to measure things like, for instance, and this is like not at all in production, but like um, the accelerometer on this phone, for instance, if you carry this phone in your pocket and you cough, that has a signature in the accelerometer. If you, if you get people 
to vi voluntarily give up that information in return to being, being aware of what, like where the flu is spreading in a city, for instance, then maybe that could be one way of sort of like restricting the impact of like diseases, for instance. So by just measuring when people are coughing, we can start to, to create models of where diseases are sort of spreading and where they have started and so forth. That's just one example. Now, it sounds scary though, right? It's like a privacy thing. And for me, it's a Swede living in Stockholm with a very functional healthcare system. I'm not sure that I would like this. But we have examples from like um, academia where they've, they've done similar things in, in order to track, for instance, malaria. And in certain parts of the world where malaria might kill your whole family, giving up that sort of information might be a very, good tr very simple trade-off when it comes to privacy. Yeah, I give you this information, and in return, I might be able to stay away from getting really ill. So those kind of things are quite interesting, and they sort of highlight also the sort of interesting tension between what you can do with these devices and these technologies and privacy, for instance, and value. What kind of value are we talking about when you're not get getting malaria? Is there a price on that? Or, you know, how are you, how, how are you treating that? So those are the things that we're thinking about when we're talking about all this data we can generate from devices and network today. Uh, and we have, we have several, I mean, we have these, I think, the, the, the traffic loads and stuff, very interesting things. Uh, one thing that we already do today, I give up a lot of my information about where I am to, to companies like Waze, for instance, in return for better traffic information in order to, to, to avoid traffic queues and so forth. So there's like a lot of things that you can start to get, you know, to, to start to elaborate on right now. The thing is, it's not very fixed. You know, it's not sorted right now. What's sort of like sensitive and what's not sensitive? Uh, we are s still trying to sort of sort of figure that one out. One thing, though, that is very interesting that I think we're not looking into uh, deeply enough right now is how we how we make that sort of negotiation clear. What we want to do with this information and in the networks, and how we sort of communicate that with the people the organizations, the cities that generate that data, how do we sort of make that relationship clear? I think it's a key thing, really, right. for things to happen. Great. Thank you so much, Christine. I, I want to ask a, a question to, to Pedro and to Rand, and it will be the same question. I mean, Christian alluded to this when he talked about the example of Waze. I mean, Waze, arguably, at the simplest level, um, is a transaction. You give up some of the information that you own or you think you own um, in return for a service. They provide you information on traffic. This transaction is sometimes less clear. It's less explicit, the transaction between the individual and whoever's using this data. So my question to you, Pedro, first as a, as a public official is you're, you're b between two worlds. You're defending the public interest, but you, are, you, 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 you probably like to have as much data as possible to be able to do better things with it. Are you a, an open data advocate, unrestricted, or do you have some um, you know, questions about that? Uh, I believe in, hello, I believe in equilibrium, you know, balance, uh, not everything should be open or closed. For whom and how is this data being used? He was talking about how, how to make this agreement uh, public or even w is it possible to be an opt-in uh, situation where I choose how my information will be used? I don't know, but if I, I've posted a photograph of the opening ceremony well, I'm in Ibirapuera, Sao Paulo. How can I, how is it possible for me to want uh, people not to know where I am if I put the picture in Facebook, for example? So if I, if I want to be offline, I should be really offline. Turn my GPS off, shut my cell phone off. Uh, as a citizen, when I want to be invisible, I go to the mountains or something like this. I can be in Leblon Beach running or using my bike. So as, as authority, something like this, I believe that data is as uh, a material for us to work. Uh, primary material, materia prima in Portuguese. So as much data as we can have, as better it is. 
so, because we know how we are going to use it. But someone, I will leave my job, and another person will be there. Other brains, other ideas are going to operate the city. Uh, and in that moment, I perhaps I might be have some anxiety about what do they know right. about myself. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's about balance. It's about balance. How much do we want people to know? That's great. Rand, do you want to come in on this same question and then Christian briefly? Uh, which one? The one of op open data? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're a guy who, who probably gets very excited when you access a very cool data set. So are you an unrestricted open data enthusiast or do you maybe as, as a citizen think, okay, well, there needs to be some boundaries that will be set? And then Christian will come in on the same point. So I, I agree with Pedro 100%. You cannot open everything. It's just not, it's not viable economically for companies producing the data to just give it away for free all the time. Right? Sometimes it makes sense to you know, keep it internal and try to turn it into a useful service or product. Right? So open data is extremely important, but that's just like one tiny piece of the puzzle. What's more important is that companies who are looking at ways to exploit the data they have can they reach out to small companies and researchers like, uh, like us, essentially, who know what to do with it and work together. So I think what's important is open innovation, not necessarily open data. And you know, when I hear Pedro talk about the data they're collecting at the, you know, at the operations center, you know, as a data scientist, I'm thinking, oh, God, like, I'm actually excited. You know, I'm like, generally more excited by this than you know, like anything else I've done today, I guess. Because you know, I can see that there is, sorry, about, you know, there is a potential collaboration that could happen eventually, you know, where we will be able to access data that we never had access to. And they're going to be able, you know, to crowdsource utilization of their data through, you know, lots and lots and lots of people interested in looking at it. And I think this is really powerful. Great. Christian, do you want to come in on this point? And then I have a question for David. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually have two comments uh, when it comes to open data, which I think is... Um, Interesting because I, I agree it's uh, it's financially difficult to, to sort of like open everything up. Uh, there we have a really interesting um, legislation issue coming up right now, of course, in the U.S., in the U in, in Europe, China, and India, where you can see very different views on what we should be able to know about our own data, which I think is um, part of what I'm doing research on right now. It's quite interesting. Challenges definitely. Uh, so we can talk about that during the break later on. Um, but I think, you know, one thing that I think is important, because when you get this question, like, what can you do with all this data? It's actually some things, some things that I used to say at Ericsson, which pisses a lot of engineers off, really, is that I think, in, to some extent, data is not per se knowledge. It's um, you don't get clever because you have a lot of data. It's, uh, as a designer, I'm quite used to turn things upside down by just asking why. Why on earth do we need this data? And why is also sort of like the framework for asking relevant questions. So sometimes, and I agree with you, it's quite fascinating to look at a big data set and try to see patterns in it. But it's quite often, you know, this like, it's like you're looking for something like a eureka moment kind of thingy. But at the, at the same time, I am a strong advocate of actually framing the questions before you start looking at the data as well. You know, being very po to the point, saying, what are we trying to see here? What are we trying to address? And not saying like, oh, we need to see a correlation between like, I don't know, you know, people uh, driving red cars on the motorway or something like that and weather. But, you know, really like trying to ask, understand what kind of questions, ask the really difficult questions to your data before you actually start to look for the answers. That's the that's what I'm really trying to address right now. Great. Thank you. David, um, you've, you've written about um, some uh, a sentence that I like, like a lot, which is that smart cities lead to dumb citizens. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that and how that, that fits into the whole openness and the fact that we're permanently producing and consuming data? Yeah, happy to. I think really quickly about the issue on privacy and open data and are there limits? I think that there is a generational difference. And, and I find that when I meet people who were born before 1980, they care about privacy for, for privacy's sake. Mm. And they say, I want privacy. When I meet people who were born after 1980, they don't care about privacy until it negatively affects their reputation. And then they say, now I really care about privacy a lot. I think that they're more concerned about their reputation than privacy as this kind of right to not being 
seen. I was born in 1980, so I'm just confused. I don't know <laughs> where I stand. In terms of smart cities and, and dumb citizens, I think that oftentimes when we speak about smart cities, and this is a narrative that's mostly been controlled by, by corporations that have a business interest in the smart city idea, we're really talking about smart sensors and not smart citizens. When we build cities around particular technologies, we end up with cities like Brasilia. I'm sorry if there's anyone from Brasilia here. It's a beautiful city if you're a car. It's a terrible city if you're a human. It's not a great place to walk around. It's not a great place to live. I've spent a lot of time there. And it's what happens when you build a city around a particular technology, in this case, the automobile. The Brasilias of today are Songdo in South Korea. They're Mazdar City uh, in the United Arab Emirates. And they're cities that are indeed smart. They uh, have trash cans that automatically detect how much trash you have, and then they call out to trash can, uh, trucks that come and collect trash when everything's ready. But the idea of the smart city that's based on sensors is that we think less, not more. And sometimes I'm okay with that because I don't want to spend my limited, very limited cognitive energy on where to find a parking space or how I can reduce my energy consumption. But I think that there are two major concerns here. One is that as we all become automatons, just following what our alerts and notifications on our phone tell us to do, we don't consider the larger issues and the political issues that are facing our cities. Two, really political issues facing our cities, such as social inclusion and the informal aspects of our cities, can become hidden and disguised behind big data that's observed as being neutral and apolitical and there to tell stories. Uh, so rather than focusing on issues that are difficult to quantify, such as public spaces, we really give a lot more time and resources to those issues that are easily quantified, such as how can we reroute traffic most efficiently. I think that there are two alternatives to the smart sensor model, which is more focused on the smart citizen one from government and one from civil society. The government model uh, comes from Boston and Philadelphia, and it's the new office for urban mechanics, which is in both of these cities. And they promote something called participatory urbanism, which involves the individual in creating a vision of what do we want our city to look like in 20 years, in 30 years? How can we reimagine public spaces? How can we reimagine education so that it meets the needs of individual humans, not so how can we apply a certain technology to our city? The second model, based here in Sao Paulo, is, is NOSA Sao Paulo. It's an NGO. And there are 70 other citizen observatories like it. Uh, and their methodology is very interesting. Usually, they're linked to academic institutions. They track 100 quality of life indicators in cities across the region, year after year, that come directly from governments. And they say, how are we doing across time? Are our economy is improving? Is our waste management improving? And then they hire a polling company to do citizen surveys of a representative sample of at least 2,000 citizens. So if the official indicator is, how is our unemployment this year compared to last year, the perception question is, do you feel that more or less of your neighbors are unemployed this year compared to last year? Because perceptions are very important. Mm -hmm. So I think that if we apply this second model to cities, the smart citizen model, that's really what we want out of the quantified city rather than focusing on, on the smart sensors. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. I think you're, that was very insightful, perhaps because you straddle these two groups. Uh, uh, b being born in 1980, you've got a good percep percep perspective on both. And I do want to underline the two organizations that David was just talking about, Rede Nosa Sao Paulo, um, and some of them are here, and we're really glad to be partnering uh, with them around this summit. Fantastic, my friend Ariel is over there, fantastic organization here in Sao Paulo and they will be speaking in a panel later on in the summit. And the Boston Office of Urban Mechanics is also a member of the New Cities Foundation and is an absolutely great source of innovation. I'd also, we, I mean, it was really great to see that in our competition called App My City, which we launched uh, a few months ago, and the final will be tomorrow, so many of the contestants in the apps were doing sort of citizen projects using data. It wasn't just, uh, you know, we didn't restrict the field of applicants, but really a lot of programmers and a lot of teams are working on this, this very interesting interface between the citizen and the government using data and technology. So that's really, really great. 
Um, in, I, I'm going to ask one final question to, to Bruno, and then I would really encourage all of you, I know we have a microphone somewhere, to ask questions. So if you could just prepare your questions, uh, we'll have one final question from Bruno, and then I'd really like us to use the last, next 15 minutes uh, for you, tell us who you are, and um, help us have uh, the best discussion possible. But Bruno, I just want to come back to you because you, you represent a a, a large company that has interactions around the uh, issue of data with cities. Can you just tell us very briefly what some of the, 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 the best case studies of your interactions between the private sector and the public sector, what the, some of the successes have been and how you would want to go forward in this interaction between private and public? Yeah, so, so if, we, um, if we think about the um, Internet of Things, if we think about this uh, intelligent object, you can think about all what the, um, the industry is providing today uh, for their consumer. Uh, cars are communicating. They are going to communicate, in, to communicate within themselves. They are going to give uh, us a lot of information. And um, the question here is not so much uh, how this is going to happen, because it's going to happen, but how uh, those objects are going to well communicate with cities. And uh, there was an example, a discussion, but yes, when you operate a train, when you operate a, a firelight and uh, all of this, you can take advantage about what is a real situation around. So this is what we do at the moment. There is many projects in order to, to see the city as a system where the uh, urban planner is going to, to become a kind of uh, uh, system architect, being able to uh, leverage all this industrial product and take advantage of it in order to uh, better administrate and operate his city. And this is uh, one of the many projects we have, uh, we're having with uh, our uh, car, uh, car customer, BMW and some other, and uh, working with some city and especially in France. At the same time, uh, we have projects where people want to operate a, a ski station, and where, and this is the example I have that you will see on the video I will provide to you, where, where you have to have all the material, all the system working together in order to uh, facilitate the life of uh, the people who are going to ski and uh, avoid any traffic jam. And uh, this is also the kind of system that uh, people are working together in order to deliver. So there is a lot of things going on. It's how all these uh, systems are communicating, working together, and really supporting uh, the, uh, the benefit of uh, the citizen and the consumer. Great. Thank you so much, Bruno. So questions. Uh, please, we've got a question here. Please tell us who you are, and if you're pointing the question to a mem particular member of the panel, please tell us who you'd like to answer your questions. Okay, hi. Yes. My name is Julia Michaels. I feel like I'm in an airport here. <laughs> I write Rio Real blog, which is a bilingual blog about the transformation of Rio, and I have a question for Pedro. Uh, the operations center in Rio is a municipal operation, uh, but the state government has just opened a command center and I'm curious to know, the, the state command center seems to focus mostly on security, uh, the police, different, different groups who, who are dealing with security in Rio. Um, I'd like to know, how, what is the difference between the state uh, operation center and the city one? And are they working together? Is there overlap? Is there cooperation? Is there competition? Uh, I can imagine situations in which security and traffic, for example, would be connected. I'd like to know how will that work. Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, since the, since the, when they were developing the idea of existing the, our operation center, the idea of the state one was, was there already. But the city built, uh, built it faster. <laughs> the state, the state uh, operation center, yes, it, it involves security, firemen, the police, the military police, and the forensic police. And we work together. We have a very tight uh, relationship. One of, the, one of, one of my crews, uh, the IT person, Alexandre Cardman, he talks a lot to, 
to the person that is building, that has built the, the state operations center. And of course, we, we thought about this overlap. Perhaps we could uh, live particular difficult situations, but since they are just being born, we still don't, uh, we still haven't had the opportunity to work a lot together in terms, uh, practically, in terms of operating the city. But as I believe, uh, of course, we have the political issue. Right now, state and the city are together politically. What I believe is that they will, we will manage to work together. Our core businesses are different. They have a difficult structure. You all might agree with me. Imagine many military organisms, structures together. How are they going to be coordinated? If I'm the, if I'm the fireman leader and he's the police, the military police leader, how is there going to be someone between us coaching us or leading us? This is a very difficult issue that they will have to deal with. In our situation, we deal much more with civil organizations, the civil guard, the civil defense, the health institution, the subway. Uh, this characteristic makes our job a little bit easier in these terms. But uh, we are happy with their existence. It's like we, we want a cousin or a brother <laughs> that thinks as we do, that believe in integration and that believe in technology to make people's lives better. So right. we are happy at all, very yeah. happy. And I think there's a question right here. And I think, um, I think that's a very good, good example because all countries have overlapping layers of government. So, you know, who's going to use, uh, who's going to collect and use the data? There's going to be competition between public bodies and cooperation, as you say, between cousins. So the, 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 the example in the question is a very, very relevant one, not just for Rio and not just for Brazil, but for a lot of countries. So again, I think this, this experiment in Rio is extremely, extremely interesting. Who's next? Who's got a microphone? Yes. Um, Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, Raul Gupta with uh, PwC. Thank you very much for the panel. We, we've talked a lot about big data from the perspective of uh, companies and those researchers. So we collect, we track, we analyze, we store. I would like us to touch about on the data from the uh, perspective of the user and the consumer. So if you have all this information and you're not actually putting in the hands of the user, at the end of the day, you're trying to change behavior. You're trying to improve the lives of those who are actually going to be leveraging this data and benefiting from it. What are you doing from your company's perspective to actually make that easier, to build the capacity of the users and the consumers, once the data is out there, to actually understand it right. and start changing the behavior over time? Because otherwise, why are we doing it? Yeah. That's a great question, uh, and, and particularly as as many people have alluded to this morning in the opening plenary and, and, and on this panel that we're, you know, we're, we're as, as individuals, we're under a deluge of data. So how do you, who would like to take this question of the, the Christian, you want to start? A anybody can jump in. We'll do this very informally. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, uh, hello, hello. Yeah, uh, I think it's a very, very uh, uh, hard question to answer, but, um, we are, uh, right now, I can, well, spill the beans a little bit because I'm presenting this internally in a few weeks' time. Uh, we're actually looking into that very question. Uh, how on earth, if we have all of this data, and I'm not talking only about Ericsson per se, I'm talking about all companies. We know that, for instance, there's a lot of legislation coming up now in, in all kinds of different, different part of, parts of the world, m basically addressing what you're just talking about. The Right to Know Act in the US, for instance, um, in the EU, we have a lot of things going on as well. We believe that there will be consequences. We believe that this will, we will have to cater for that. I mean, not perhaps like next month, but in a few years' time, there will probably be legis legislative uh, rules, basically, telling us you know, that we need to address these issues. Uh, and it, you know, it's very complicated because it sounds easy to say, right, everyone should open up, but it's actually not that very, not, I mean, from a technical perspective, it's actually quite difficult because the data is usually hidden somewhere, you know, in big 
in, in, the, in the big systems of corporations. They might even not, not even be individual tags to the data after a while, you know, it's just like, you know, they sort of disappear after a while because it's not interesting, it's the, the, the statistics that are interesting. So we have to deal with those kind of things, but even more, how on earth do we create some sort of mechanism, some sort of framework that allows individuals to understand this and to make sure that you can actually control this in one way or another? And how do you negotiate that between the individual and the different companies, especially given that some of this information might be very crucial to some companies? You know, it's like for a mobile operator, for, in, for instance, the traffic associated with, with, their, with, their, uh, with their subscribers, you know, if the subscribers can take the traffic and move to someone else and say, right, this is my, prof my, this is my profile, what can you give me? Those kind of things are really interesting. So we, what we try to do right now, and this is the research that I'm working on, uh, together with uh, a very good crew, we're trying to understand how on earth should we go about this from an individual's perspective and from a corporate perspective in order to make sure that this sort of negotiation is transparent and values are shared and, and made explicit and so forth. It's very difficult. I can t tell you more when people are not recording too much. Uh, yeah. We'll turn the oh, I'm losing on. touch here. Chris, uh, David, did you want to jump in quickly? Very, very quickly. I think it's, it's very key to point out that there is a difference between data and knowledge. Data are proxies for really complex phenomena that need to be compared to other points of reference, and knowledge actually informs decisions. Data is expanding very rapidly, but the interpretation of that data into knowledge is not able to, to keep pace with that. And the other really important difference is between correlation and causation. And oftentimes with data, there are a lot of companies out there, for example, that use data about how consistently we recharge our phones, and then they give us a credit score based on how consistently we recharge our phones. Maybe I'm very credit worthy, but I don't recharge my phone consistently. And so there you have an effective causation that, or correlation that doesn't represent the causation of me as an individual. And I think we need to be careful about that. Christian, uh, Pedro, go ahead, and then Christian, very briefly. Yep. As a quick response, we have inside the operations center uh, a press room. It's right above my, my office. So everything that the press knows, it can exchange with us. And everything that we know and everything that we are living inside of the operations center, they can see through the glass that shows all this right. big video wall and the people moving from one place to the other. And they can listen to it because we have uh, we, we've made a window. So the press is inside of the operations center. And this is the way that we like right. to democratize what we know, if this is a word. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> Christian, do you want to? Yeah. I just want to, uh, I think David's comment was really good. And I think one of the things that we are really working on right now in this project that I just mentioned is how on earth do you make how do, how do you help individuals to understand the data that they have? And if you think about it, you have data in a vast number of places right now. And what we're trying to address right now, it's actually a, a, quite a bit of a design uh, exercise. How do you create the understanding of the implications? Because you know, individual pieces of data are one thing, but the very fact that they might be cor correlated between companies and so forth, and they might be aggregated in certain places and not, those kind of things are really I, I would say, I mean, from a design perspective, really interesting, and that's what we're trying to, tr trying to address right now. Great. Let's just take uh, a few other questions. Three, three questions. Okay, we'll take three questions in one go and, and answer them in... Adam, please. Uh, Adam Freed. Yep, yep. Adam Freed with the Nature Conservancy Forum with Mayor Bloomberg's Office of Sustainability in New York City was curious about the tension between using data, which is often historic in nature, uh, in an increasingly uncertain world, particularly in light of climate change and, and the utility with that, and also the utility of data for both real-time solutions and adaptive management versus those long-term solutions and strategies, which often have that degree of unpredictability with them. Great question. We'll t yeah, we'll take three questions and then we'll, we'll field them to the panel. Please go ahead and introduce yourself, please. Hi, uh, I'm Andrew Mills. I'm a journalism professor at Northwestern University's international campus in Qatar. Uh, a lot of the work I do uh, about cities and journalism about cities is in the global south. 
and uh, particularly now in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And it seems to me that except for some rather small kind of boutique projects, um, big data still doesn't really have a great application in cities in the developing world, which as we all know, are the uh, most acutely urbanizing cities right now. And so I wonder from, from your perspectives up there, if you are seeing a change here, uh, if you're seeing any kind of um, really new and interesting uh, applications for what you do in, in cities in the developing world. Thanks very much. Great. Okay, we'll take one, one more and then we'll, end, we'll try to answer those. Hi, good morning. My name is Paula Medaglia and I'm wondering if the panel would like to comment on data and advocacy because I think we can develop amazing technology to avoid traffic, improve mobility, and then you have national governments who give incentives to the car industry, for instance. And the same principle could be applied to health, education. So do you think we could use data to promote smart advocacy? Thanks. Smart advocacy. Okay, so we have three questions, if I can summarize them. One was, Adam had two questions, was um, about historic data, the use of historic data in, in doing, um, helping with uh, predictive in a fast changing world and he used the example of climate change. The second question was big data being used for real time solutions versus sort of long term planning exercises. And uh, the second question was about the global south and big data is not, was not really for the developing world. I think Sao Paulo is an example to the country. I think certainly Rio is an example to the country, but are there other examples? And the third was about data and advocacy. Can, does anyone want to field any of these? Rand, go ahead. So I'd like to uh, address the first question. So that every time I talk, every time huh? you speak. <laughs> It's, it's actually not two questions. I believe it's one question. Uh, indeed, historical data does not mean that whatever you observe before is going to hold in the future. You know, despite what has been done, you know, this is the first thing you learn in finance is, you know, past performance is not indicative of future performances. It's exactly the same thing in everything. What's important is that instead of creating a model that extrapolates from history, you need to create a model that accurately represents the context that generated a behavior in the past, right? So it's contextual modeling versus extrapolation. Extrapolation, don't do that. Like, honestly, this is a difference between experienced data scientists and amateurs, right? Experienced data scientists always think about why would this have happened? And they figure out ways to model that. And they then use techniques like machine learning, whatever, to calibrate the model based on historical data. And this is very important because when you, can, when you can do that, then you're able to also predict things that never happened in history, but still, you know, you know have potentially can happen. So this is the first thing. This, I think, addresses the first question. The second question, you know, real time versus, you know, essentially predictive. Uh, a predictive model can only give you an indication of what is highly likely to happen, you know, in whatever time frame you're looking at. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, right? It's probabilistic. And if you change the system, you're probably going to change the outcome. And you need to be able to measure whatever change you're doing is going to affect the future. Real time is different. Real time is more about very quickly processing the data you're getting and very quickly measuring everything that happens. And you know, for me, these are two very important things that needs to be done. You need to be able to react quickly, but you also need to be able to prevent and predict so that you actually don't have to react and don't have a problem in the first place. Anyone else on any of these three? Perhaps on advocacy or the mm -hmm. global south? Just to complement, uh, for example, I was talking about the, a research we done, we've done in the operation center about motorcycles falls. Because we've been inputting data for the last two and a half years, we've come to a particular situation Every Friday from 5.30 p.m. to 7 p.m., we have 55, 60% of the motorcycles falls in Rio. So what perhaps next Friday, not this particular number, but there is a why in this situation. It's the end of the week. Those who work delivering stuff, documents, using the motorcycle, they want to go home, see the family, do some barbecue or do whatever else. So they are relaxed, they are faster, they want to reach home. This can help 
a particular policy in the transportation secretary. Perhaps in those most crowded or loaded lanes, we won't allow motorcycles to be there because if they fall, we will lose thousands of people time. And of course, we will also can do and can help a policy that will try to spread the message. Go home, but reach home. Don't stay on the floor. Don't fall down. Your family is there. They will be there Saturday morning, too. So this is a way to use the past helping the future. In terms of real time, if we know where it's raining, we have 135 uh, pluviometros. In, in Portuguese, it's the equipment that measures the rain. We know a place where usually the mountain collapses above a particular number of millimeters. We are seeing it's raining. We know because of the weather prediction that we, it will continue raining. So we have that siren situation. And we are real time responding to a situation that will happen. Or Great. David. Regarding the role of data in advocacy, is this on? Okay. Regarding the role of data in advocacy, uh, yes, data can be very powerful if it's combined with good storytelling. I think that we as humans, we understand stories, we don't understand statistics, and all, this, all of the time I see NGOs that present these amazing visualizations of networks and whatnot, and you look at it and you're like, wow, that's so beautiful and interesting, but I have no idea what it actually says or means or represents. Uh, but if you have a good story that represents the data that you see there, then that really tells it in a way that we can empathize with. For me, a statistic that is very impactful is that in most countries, 75% of our transit budget is dedicated to cars, and in most developing countries, only 25% of the population actually owns cars. So you have this great unbalance there. But you have to tell stories about people taking two hours a day in public transit to get to work for that to really sink in with people about why is this important or not. And I'm sorry, really quickly, there's a conference later this month by the Tactical Technology Collective about the role of data in advocacy campaigns. Great. Okay, with that, I, I know there are many, many more questions, but we've run over time. I really want to thank very warmly our panelists for this really great panel, for, for, for putting up with me as, a, as an improvised moderator, for putting up with a sound environment which is perhaps less than ideal, so our apologies for that. We'll try to improve it in the next panel. And I did just want to acknowledge uh, Michael, for <laughs> who, who was supposed to be in my chair, so who's back there, and, and we're, we're glad you made it, Michael, and apologies for for the, the problems with traffic, but I think with all, everything we've heard in the last hour and 15 minutes, there will be no more traffic problems next time we do the New City Summit. Thanks very much. There's uh, food, great food downstairs, and I would ask those of you who want to join Daniel Liebeskin's plenary session in the Auditorio to be there at 2.25. Thank you very much. <laughs>